Hey, everyone. My name is Amira. And for those of you I haven't met yet, I'm the head of policy at the Solana Foundation. We're coming in today with uh, the second of a two-episode series where we talk to sitting members of Congress about their views on CBDCs. So if you missed yesterday's episode with Congressman Tom Emmer, highly recommend going back to check it out uh, either before or after you listen to today's show. Yeah, today we're bringing you kind of a part two of that conversation uh, with Representative Bill Foster. So let's dive in. Congressman, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. So we're uh, we're going to get into talking about crypto and CBDCs in a second, but I wanted to just focus at a high level. You know, you, you have a background that's a little unusual for Congress. And, um, you know, you were previously a physicist at Fermilab. And you've said that you're the only member of Congress who's actually coded a simple blockchain mm-hmm. client. So, you know, I'm curious what got you interested in blockchain in the first place? Well, yeah, I spent a lot of my uh, career in science, um, you know, doing computer code uh, generally. Um, and so, uh, you know, actually, I I think I'm the only member of Congress who's uh, actually designed integrated circuits. I've, uh, I'm very proud that I'm 10 for 10 and having all of my IC designs work the first time, which is non-trivial. Um, actually, during back in the 90s, I first programmed neural networks, which are now obviously heavily used for artificial intelligence. And so I've you know been interested in technology, and since I've been on financial services, uh, there the technological change that's about to or is has been washing over uh, financial services. The whole fifteen years that I since I first started being on the financial services committee has been uh, an important part, and it's you know it's had its positive moments and its negative moments, <laughs> like structured financial products and so on. We're not just a lot of which were. Um, were uh, generated by physicists or retired physicists. Um, and so it's it's important to understand the the technological underpinnings of uh, the technologies that we grow dependent on. I want to dig into the CBDC Anti-Surveillance Act, um, which passed the House only a couple of weeks ago. And, and you were uh, voting against this bill alongside, uh, you know, 191 members of Congress, mostly Democrats. I'm curious at a high level, uh, you know, can you tell us what what drove your vote to vote against this bill? Well, there are a bunch of things. You know, for example, uh, I think there are very few privacy and surveillance objections to a wholesale CDBC. And so the idea that you're going to ban, for example, wholesale CDBC, which is basically an, a potentially more efficient way of just clearing uh, money transfers between banks and other large financial players, Uh, probably a permission blockchain and any realistic implementation of it. Um, But the idea that we'd be banning those when they might be a more efficient way to just for banks to do business between themselves is one example. I think the big problem there is that Congress has not yet come to grips with the big issue of privacy. And that that is important when it gets to uh, when you're talking about self-hosted wallets. And there's sort of a, you know, the question I had when we had Mark Zuckerberg uh, in front of our committee with his Libra project, uh, he, uh, we had a Zuckerberg and I think a representative of the um, the Libra Association. And I asked him what I think the fundamental question is, is your product going to be supported on anonymous self-hosted wallets? And Zuckerberg said, of course, no, we'll be regulated. And then the Libra Association guy said, of course, yes. And so that this is something I've just encountered continuously is is different industry players talking out of both sides of their mouth on this, that either blockchain is traceable or it's not, um, you know, that sort of thing. And and then that's the core question that was not answered really in any of the legislation. You know, are we going to uh, want to live in a world where large financial transactions can take place through anonymously hosted wallets? And you can answer that yes or no. But if your answer is yes, you cannot stop uh, ransomware. You know, you cannot stop all many abusive um, the uses of of crypto. And so, so that's I think the big question we have there. And I think that a lot of the a lot of the regulators that have looked at this around the world say what we need in the end is not absolute privacy, but some controlled, limited privacy. And uh, so that's you know, everyone from the Bank of International Settlements to um, oh, Nellie Lang or, or many other senior uh, Americans, you know, have, have thought about this. 
that we have to have some way when, you know, when a crime has been committed to go and figure out who it is who actually participated in the transactions. And that's different than surveillance. And we have to, I think it's important to distinguish between ongoing continuous surveillance where you're, where the government is listening and analyzing things as they are happening with no suspicion of a crime and the ability and controlled anonymity, which means when you get a validated investigation, when you get a, a court warrant, you can then de-anonymize the transactions and figure out um, what happened. You know, for example, when FDX blew up, I would be perfectly okay if, a, if some court um, had said, okay, something bad here has happened. I want to know all the true identities of everyone that put money or crypto in or out of FTX in the last few months of its existence. And because it's clear some criminal activities happened there and that you could then trace some of the things that at least for a while seem to have disappeared there. Um, and so this is, that's very different than surveillance. And I think there's an important decision also distinction to be made between whether you're talking about crypto assets that are pegged, for example, pegged to the dollar, stable coins, for which you don't have to worry about market manipulation. All right. Uh, you know, a stable coin, as long as it's appropriately backed by actual assets, um, is, you know, always going to be worth, you know, a, a dollar, for example. Um, and so those, then you don't have to, the amount of surveillance that you need is very different for those. You're then, the only thing you're worried about with with fixed value crypto assets um, are the ability for um, potentially for government to track all individual um, individual private payments on things. And so we have to have very strong guardrails against doing that until you can prove that a crime has been committed. All right. And so that is, and that's the, that's the threshold you have to make. And you have to, you have to put in the technical hooks into the design of your system to allow that to happen. So I think we have a ton of surface area to talk about this. And I really want to push on, um, you know, what you said around the, the nature of how we think about privacy in the space. But, but before we get off CBDCs too much, just because I want to make sure that, um, you know, listeners sort of better, best understand your position, um, you know, with respect to with respect to CBDCs in particular, I want to understand: Are you more pro CBDC? Or are you uh, more anti banning a CBDC? Just to understand sort of your position on this act in, in particular, and where um, what was really driving you right there? I am well. I am pro uh, in favor of CBDCs that provide the right kind of controlled anonymity. And them, I'm not in favor of CDBCs that simply become a graceful on-ramp and off-ramp to anonymous uh, self-hosted uh, assets on the that can be traded um, on the dark web or whatever. Um, and so this is this is, I think, the the um, the real split, you know, ideological split that's happening here. Uh, that you know, they're members of um, of. <laughs> Of the Republican Party that believe that things like automobile driver's licenses are, or automobiles license plates are an unwarranted intrusion on privacy. Okay, and it's it's a point of view, but it's not one that's I think shared by the American public. And so that's a um, so I think we have to yeah you know, we have to understand the risks and the benefits of different kinds of controlled privacy here. And um, and that was the one of the it was the failure to have any adult discussion of the controlled privacy thing that was one of the biggest problems with uh, you know the the things that republicans were producing for floor votes in the last few weeks it sounds like what i'm hearing is that you're not particularly passionate about a cbdc one way or another but you think that we can have a cbdc um if and only if there's controlled privacy on the cbdc and and what the anti surveillance the cbdc anti surveillance act did was was not provide a route for any kind of controlled privacy on a cbdc is that a fair interpretation of of your stance i think that's pretty fair more efficiently presented than i did yeah i would say there's no industry consensus on if a cbdc would be good or or bad one of the positives of it is is the on ramping right now is still a, you know, T plus one to T plus five day experience. Um, and there's no real reason it has to be that that slow. We have the technology now to enable something much closer to real-time payments. 
on, on the other side, I think the, you know, to use license plate analogy you're using before, I think the idea of a license plate in a world where we don't have automatic cameras on the back of police cars scanning every license plate as the police car drives down, we don't have cameras everywhere, is a very different proposition than one where we have a active surveillance process going on. Where, you know, me as someone who's done nothing wrong, when I drive, you know, my license plate's being scanned by automatic license plate readers and my movements are being tracked. And while that is, uh, you know, technically constitutional, I, it, it does not, it is not necessarily the privacy agreement that we signed when we signed up for license plates. And so uh, I'm sort of wondering how you, how you would think about the appropriate level of privacy control when we're talking about these, these sorts of systems. Well, the model that I like is the, you know, James Bond's license plates that rotate, you know, the ones that flip through. Yes. Um, and so those are certainly analogous to algorithmic wallets, if you know what I'm talking about there. You know, you can make things where you can examine yes. the blockchain and, and see that, okay, this was definitely a transaction between two licensed wallets and cryptographically verify their valid wallets, but still have no idea who's behind them. However, and then they can be changing like James Bond's thing. So it's difficult to track them through a whole chain of interactions. What is sort of the thing you were worried about. Um, and yet for each one of those plates, if you can prove a crime has been committed, that a trusted court system um, it can de-anonymize those. And so that you have to, this requires a certain amount of trust in government that may or may not be present. But, you know, in, in Scandinavian countries, every time any federal bureaucrat accesses any data that they have on you, you are entitled to, entitled to notification of that access, all right? Which I think is a very good principle to have, and it works very well because people trust the government. And so that's one of the big, um, you know, a lot of money has been spent trying to vilify the government by organizations that think that wealthy people shouldn't be taxed and Part of that is to vilify everything the government does. And so this is, um, you know, this is, I think, the, the part of the core ideological split that you're seeing on this is whether you can ever imagine a world where the government could be trusted with things like privacy. And, sure. and the reality is we already trust the government with a tremendous amount of private information. The IRS is example number one of that. I mean, you know, it's in fact true that every one of us already has an account with the federal government. You know, you argue about um, account-based CDBCs, but you know, when you say I'm going to apply this year's IRS refund to next year's tax payment, guess what? You have an account with the federal government. And the only difference is that I can't give you $10 of the balance by getting on my cell phone, authenticating and transferring it to you. But, you know, we have all the problems with identity fraud and everything else in the IR interactions with the IRS. Um, you know, which gets me to another big issue that we have to get to, which is secure digital identity for any of this to make sense. And that's. Yeah, I want to I want to push on this a little more because I think the the counter argument that you would get from, I'm guessing, Congressman Emmer and, and probably a lot of our colleagues in industry is we've given government a lot of data and um, we haven't we haven't actually seen a commitment to responsibility with that data, right? So one is just, we just have a really sweeping, um, or, or I think like a uh, collection of data is pretty sweeping. So I think last year, two years ago, 2.5 million suspicious activity reports were filed. Uh, just like any any transaction that's over $10,000 is, you know, logged and filed with, with Treasury. Um, and I think a lot of people would say like, why is Treasury collecting 2.5 million suspicious activity reports? That is clearly way too much. And so we've given government too much license to collect data at this point. Well, and so well, why, what is your, what is your um, estimate for the number of financial crimes? I mean, a, a significant fraction of the ongoing investigations, um, you know, have been triggered by SARS reports. I mean, my predecessor in Congress, uh, Dennis Hastert, the former Republican speaker, you know, served jail time because of a SARS. He was paying off uh, a victim of his child molestation from his previous coup using using payments that were structured in a way that triggered SARS. And and so that's well, I that's think, not um, yeah. just to be clear. I don't think I don't think people are saying don't collect suspicious activities reports. Although some some people might be, I think people might be saying there's probably some kind of throttling that happens between 
like in the scale of millions versus what you really need to really understand the uh, nature of illicit crime. And we should be in maybe in addition to looking for um, opportunities to KYC every wallet, um, chances to like really, really push Treasury um, to focus in on where where they actually need to be collecting data as opposed to every single transaction that's over ten thousand dollars and meets certain qualifications. I, I think the criticism is that it's a it's a pretty sweeping regime right now. I, that's what that's what a lot of my colleagues yeah. would say. Well, you know, it's a question of whether you trust government when they access different kinds of data. Um, I think from a technical point of view, ten million is not going to be a big number from the point of view of AI. You know, AI will easily be able to swallow a lot more than that. So that, and I'm sure in, um, I'm sure in countries like China that they have relatively straightforward AIs that determine all kinds of patterns of payments and um, already because they, um, India as well, you have they've set up a system where you have you know almost complete surveillance, and that is not something that I or I think really any any American advocates for. Uh, the the question at hand, and I think the one we really should come to terms with, when you have convinced a trusted court system that a tri- crime has been committed, can you then go back and figure out who the, the principals were involved on that? And that's something that's technically feasible by things like um, digitally registering wallets. Um, and from a technical point of view, it's a very straightforward thing. FinCEN, for example, the financial crimes network, can simply say, if you know you, you want to light up a wallet, go get it registered and get a certificate from FinCEN that say, yeah, we understand that's associated with a legally traceable person, but have a secure, you know, have a belief and and a law that says you cannot just willy-nilly go accessing that information, that there has to be very controlled circumstances like a court warrant um, uh, that, you know, that allows you to actually go and figure out who's behind that wallet. Um, Now, there's a different, I think it's important also to distinguish between two different kinds of crypto transactions. There are ones, for example, with stable coins, where you're not worried about market manipulation. The only real worries are that it's being used for some criminal purpose. Okay, under those circumstances, I think it's reasonable to, um, you know, just wait until you prove a crime has been committed and then be able to figure out who did it. The situation is different for crypto assets with a market value you know, with a market determined value, because under those circumstances, you have to worry about things like wash trading, front running your customers, you know, the whole litany of of, of, cry, of frauds against the market that have been, you know, going on for hundreds of years. And so in this circumstance, um, you know, as we learned the hard way with uh, derivatives regulations, you know, back at Dodd-Frank times 15 years ago, there really isn't an alternative. If you're going to detect wash trades, you have to have some regulator somewhere that sees the true identity between people on both sides of a trade. You know, otherwise you simply have no idea whether it's you know Melania Trump uh, issuing an NFT and then buying it back and forth through anonymous wallets and then finding some sucker to go buy it, um, which um, is rumored to have happened. I'm not expressing an opinion on whether it actually happened or not, but there there are estimates that a very large fraction of NFT trading are, are wash trades of some kind. The only way to clean up markets like that, which is very much what was happening in, for example, the commodities and, and derivatives industry was sort of a mess before we adopted a trader ID, uh, which is if you're going to play in the, um, in the derivatives markets, you have to have a trader ID, which is biometrically deduped, so you only get to operate one trader ID. Um, and, and then you have a market where you can know that you're actually looking at fair market prices and not prices for, for assets that are being bid up by wash trades or depressed by wash trades. Yeah. Well, let's, let's dive in. So I, th- I think we're getting sort of clear in the crux of the pros and cons of how we think about um, this kind of system with KYC um, non-custodial wallets. And so I want to address one in particular that I think draws a lot of people in crypto, which is this idea of financial inclusion. So a lot of folks will point to the fact that the traditional banking system shuts out a lot of people. Um, the KYC process right now um, leaves a lot of folks just to, out of the banking system are unable to get KYC'd. And so, you know, they would argue that we need a, 
a broader net, a way to be able to give more people more accessibility to the same kinds of tools that a lot of other folks have. And I'm curious how you respond to that idea that we have a banking system that has traditionally shut a lot of people out um, and does a lot of de-risking, oftentimes unnecessarily, and that we have an opportunity through crypto to help change that. Um, curious. Well, I mean, by responded. far the most successful solution to that has taken place in India, where because they've established a nationwide secure digital ID, where everyone has a biometrically secured digital ID that they can assert on their cell phone. Um, if there's a pauper that you want to give a couple of rupees to, <laughs> and, you know, you can, or a beggar in the street, you can both get out your cell phone, do your biometric login, um, use that to authenticate ownership of a bank account, and you can transfer a tiny amount of money for zero fee from any account to any other account securely. Um, and the you know the price because they the choices they've made setting that up, the government can see every transaction, which is a choice they have made, but not a necessary one on that. And so that is, uh, in terms of inclusion to the financial system, that is by far the most widely adopted. It has nothing to do with crypto. Um, except, all, of course, all the cell phone transactions are two-way encrypted and so on. Um, and so that there's, there's, you have to be, you have to separate that. The, the key to unlocking that is a secure digital identity. All right. There's no problem just, you know, having accounts in banks versus having um, crypto assets. Um, that's not what's important. The key to unlocking that is having a secure digital identity. Um, so that you know that you can allow transactions of any value to happen um, without worrying about the criminal abuse of that. And, you know, the the reason, yeah, can sure, I, yeah, go ahead. Can I just clarify yeah. something, Congressman? Are you arguing in favor of a similar no, sort of digital No, I'm saying that crypto is India not necessary up? to for financial inclusion, all right? That's what I'm saying, that we have an existence proof on earth today of a, you know, of a system which is has by far the most successful financial inclusion, where you can have zero cost payments between any two citizens of India, uh, which is pretty impressive. And there is no more efficient scheme than that. It doesn't, you know, if there's not in India to support the system, we don't have gigantic uh, mining operations, crypto mining operations, burning electricity and tapping into a, a big fraction of the high end uh, chip output of TSMC, which is, you know, to first order a waste of resources. And so that they have a much more efficient system. Um, and the downside of that is that because of the way they've structured it, um, they have a lot of government surveillance. And, you know, you can implement systems like that with less government surveillance or with control, more controlled government surveillance. And that's the, that's the corner I think we should be operating in. I do want to talk on that, that government surveillance component because you, I'm someone who grew up with default trust of the government. I think in, in large part there's large swaths of the government, I still default trust. The security state is not necessarily one of those though. And, you know, I'm, I'm 33. So like 9-11, the Patriot Act, warrantless wiretapping of the NSA, that was a, a lot of, you know, my my formative years in, in political identity. Um, and it seems that when push comes to shove, we are not particularly good at securing information and not breaking the rules that we've we've set up. How would you sort of propose systems that actually maintain those securities where, you know, if we do switch over to something like a CBDC, which requires registration, um, I think a lot of people could very easily see a world where, uh, you know, when there is the ability to access something or an ability to modify a system and not tell the American public that's what's happening, you could see a very large financial surveillance state like you see in India and China occur um, pretty quickly. That's our job in Congress is to make sure that the checks and balances are in place to make sure that doesn't happen. I mean, right now, uh, your credit card company, do you use credit cards, either of you? Your credit card company can get can get a national security letter that says, you know, we won't tell you why, you can't tell your customer, but we want to see every transaction that you've made, all right? And that is something that has withstood constitutional muster, but it's on the basis yes. of an official documented action um, of a of a trusted court system. And so the the challenge there is to make a trusted court system, one that when you look under the hood and see the decisions it's making is one that ordinary citizens of the United States would agree are reasonable decisions about when the government should or should not see your you know financial details. And that's a, you know, it, 
it, it's not an easy discussion. It's going to have to be handled very carefully. Um, it is really downstream of settling the foundational issue of whether we have a secure digital identity for Americans or whether we will let unlimited anonymous actions take place in all in all venues. I guess maybe a different way to ask this is, do you think encryption is a right in the United States? Uh, encryption of stolen nuclear secrets? No. If you're if you're if you're well, using it to is... buy and sell, you know it depends on there. There are some purposes for which um, the government has an override. You know, if you are you know, yeah, extreme the you know, design of how to make custom viruses for that will trigger new pandemics. There are you know, there are activities that are so intrinsically dangerous that the government, I believe, has a right to um, really extreme, um, you know extreme access to your data. If we're going to provide things like the banking system, we have the right to ask people that tap into the benefits of those to pay, uh, to respect the, um, uh, to, to respect the, the rules that keep civilization working. You know, for example, if someone says, I'm just going to go ahead and trade Bitcoin on the dark web and you can't stop me, that's correct. But if you say, I also want to be able to bring, bring un, anonymously traded crypto assets back into the lit banking system, where I take advantage of all the of all the benefits that civilization gives the banking system, then that civilization has the right to ask you as a condition of bringing anonymously traded crypto assets back in to say, no, that actually you have to be have control on that anonymity. So that's so that so what I'm saying that, you know, that what I'm saying to... is that the gate oh, go ahead. the gate for cryptographically obscuring something uh, can be maintained when the government provides uh, utilities like the regulated banking system that are that only exist because we have a functional society that that we have a right to right that if you're going to use our banking system you have to make sure that your the banking system is not being used as an on ramp for profits you've you've gained from you know, selling bioweapons. You know, that is large part how it does work today in that if you are a U.S. citizen or if you are using really any exchange in the world, they do require you to pass an extensive KYC before they will allow you to deposit a crypto asset into an exchange uh, and withdraw that to a fiat currency or, or move it to a bank account. Um, are, do you see the system today as, as insufficient? And if so, what would you like to see in place? So the, um, well, it, first it's insufficient if you just look at the fact that half of the of the North Korean nuclear program is funded with crypto, okay? That's a pretty big problem. They have, they have very high performance intercontinental ballistic missiles. Thank you, crypto, right? That is, that is you know, an existential threat to the, the U.S., you know, you know, fentanyl traffickers. If you want to buy fentanyl precursor chemicals, you just give your crypto to the Chinese factories and that's how you, the payment's transacted. So that's, you know, an example of the sort of things that we have to work harder to prevent. Okay, now the sort of system, the controlled privacy that most regulators, when they look at this, we have to get to, uh, is it's actually very analogous to the, the automobile license plates. You know, when license, when automobiles were invented, uh, then, then at first said, oh, great, anyone will be able to drive one anywhere. And they said, wait, there are problems with this. And if you think for a moment how unacceptable it would be to have unlicensed cars with unlicensed drivers driving through your neighborhood, driving across your borders, you'd see that it was really an, a, crucial, uh, a crucial element in the healthy development of the automobile industry to have license plates, to make these acceptable products for general use in the Public. And so that the same thing really applies to crypto. It's a it's a fantastic product, but only if you have some sort of controlled privacy on it. So that if, if you're just driving down the road, the person next to you, you have no idea who they really are. Okay. Um, but you know that if they drive you off the road, you can jot down their license plate, go to a trusted court system, prove a crime has been committed, and then that court will de-anonymize the license plate and let you extradite the person and drag them into court. Um, and with that kind of guarantee, it will make crypto a much better product. And so all you have to do, you know, it's only, 
it's only people that either A, think that the government is essentially untrustworthy, or B, intend to cheat or buy or steal and get away with it. You know, those are the only two corners for an objection to that sort of thing. And the vast majority of the American public doesn't live in that corner. I'll, um, I'll uh, object a bit to like that, that reduction of people who value um, self-custody. But, but I'll, I'll, offer, I'll offer a couple of counterpoints or just clarification. So I think, um, you know, we talk about North Korea. So uh, let me preface this by saying I'm a former national security professional. I care really deeply about this country's national security and, and probably find myself on the other side of a lot of debates with my colleagues for, for that reason, because I see how serious these threats are um, and, and have, have sort of lived through them during my time in government. Um, but when you look at a lot of the national security threats that are coming through to crypto, what we see is not a failure of the self-custodial system. What we see is a failure of our ability as a U.S. government to be able to track down on and off ramps and effectively police them because, um, you know, entities like North Korea are not off ramping using Coinbase. They're off ramping using, you know, Russian on and off ramps. And so the issue there is not a failure of the Russian surveillance system, which is really robust. The issue is that we as the United States don't have the ability to go sort of uh, track down what's happening or subpoena uh, an entity like Bizlato, which we sanctioned later on. Yeah, yeah. But for example, you know, those that like Nelly Lang and others that, um, uh, that have advocated for legally traceable wallets, that you simply got to put a license plate on your wallet. What that does is it allows you to make a clean, technologically straightforward distinction uh, between clean money and dirty money. So if someone offers to pay you with some crypto, you have your software look on the blockchain at the chain of custody of that at that crypto. And if it is exclusively taken place through licensed wallets, then you know it's clean money. But if you see that it has disappeared through unknown anonymous trading on um, you know, on on self-hosted wallets or, you know, wherever, then at that point, at that point you say, I'm sorry, that's dirty money. I can never legally bring that into the lit financial system. And then you, I think, made a clean, technologically straightforward separation between the area where there's a controlled anonymity um, and the Wild West. And, and the key thing there is just to have a, um, you know, have FinCEN or someone set up an API that allows people to register wallets and, and attach them to a secure, tr legally traceable identity. And I think that will be... You know, if you talk to like uh, financial or crypto startups, it is KYCing is one of the highest, the biggest costs of entry they have and one of the hardest um, things for them to do well. And if all you had to do is say, okay, just tell your customers when they come in with a wallet, go hit hit the FinCEN API and, um, and attach a license plate to it and you finish your KYC obligations, it would make life much, much easier for your crypto startups or your fin financial startups for that matter. And so that's a that's a crucial thing, and that's why I say it has to be downstream of getting a secure digital identity um, as something that citizens who want can can have. Many countries have that, and in fact, the EU, within a couple of years now, is going to have every citizen of the EU who wants one will be able to have such a secure digital identity that allows them to prove they are who they say they are online as a legally traceable person, and then you can decide how to use that. Um, one way might be to use it to register a wallet that will then be trusted uh, in the sense of not containing dirty money. So you, you talked a moment ago about the idea that funds that are not fully traceable through verified wallets might be considered dirty. Would you apply the same structure to cash today? The difference between cash and crypto is the speed of escape from the scene of the crime. Okay. This is why we have uh, different rules uh, for for di different mm -hmm. levels of flighty assets. You know, you never see ransomware saying, um, "Please deposit twenty, you know, ten thousand dollars in unmarked twenty dollar bills in a trash can in Central Park." They don't do that. They do it. They ask for payment in crypto per because of the speed of escape from the scene of the crime. Um, there's also in there's also a big issue about finality and transactions. And that's something that I think is another very important issue for central bank digital currencies. For many commercial transactions, for consumer transactions, you actually don't want finality. All right, you want if someone you know, 
puts a gun to your head, drags you into an alley, says, get out your phone, transfer all of your crypto to me. And, oh, let's say, while we're at it, why don't you transfer the ownership of your house to me? All right. And, you know, you want to be able to go back to a trusted court system, give them proof that a crime has been committed and have them reverse that transaction. All right. You want that guarantee for many particularly high valued financial transactions. And so the idea that immediate finality is an unalloyed good is actually not one that's held by by consumers. They want to be able to say, hey, someone's using my credit card in Mexico. Um, stop and I want my money back. All right. And so that's, um, you know, that that's actually an important part of the consumer facing uh, issues with uh, central bank digital currencies or really any crypto that's being used for payments. And, and another reason why controlled privacy, you know, if someone puts your, a gun to your head and, and steals your crypto, uh, then if you can go to a court system and say, I want to know the owner of that wallet that I was forced to transfer it in, then that's then you can actually start to enforce that guarantee um, of providing some way, some recourse if a fraudulent or mistaken transaction or a coerced transaction has taken place. And so you have to have sort of an adult idea, adult attitude toward finality of transactions that is not always present in, you know, the crypto purists. I think one of the, the places my mind goes with this is the model can work well for the United States. It might even work well for some parts of the EU. Um, but U.S. dollars permeate the global economic system. They're, they're traded in Nigeria, they're traded in China, they're, you know, the system that is really the underpinning of, of currency nowadays. And, and so, you know, this is the idea of the U.S. as the global reserve currency. And so as we start to add more restrictions to this, you know, there are many countries where you cannot get a KYC provider to validate that someone is, is actually who they say they are there. That This is part of why getting a visa as an Indian citizen still continues to be very challenging is that the U.S. does not have a high trust in the Indian record keeping system. So, you know, if, if we sort of extend this model to say that money that moves internationally always needs to have full identities attached to it, um, do, do you see that as something that could hurt U.S. dollar dominance um, on the global scale? Because many of those transactions today, like wire transfers, do not have a preclearance of sort of KYC attached to them. Uh, there, you, there are a bunch of issues that you, you just touch on here. The um, the dominance of the dollar uh, for uh, denominating the value of assets, I think, has to do with the strength of our economy, the strength of our rule of law, um, and that that you sort of know that um, that when you put your money into an, an investment in America or the dollar denominated uh, assets, that you have. Um, you know, fair confidence that things aren't going to go completely nuts from a legal point of view. And that is absent in other countries. Um, and that's why at times of financial stress, money tends to flee to the United States. And so that probably our first responsibility in, on the Financial Services Committee is to make sure that we continue to uphold the rule of law and make America continue to be a safe place to invest your money. That is the strength of the dollar. Whether people offer additional products that they are they claim they are willing to exchange for real dollars is a sep is a separate issue from the, um, you know, from the fact that the U.S. has got a pretty good commitment that we're not just going to print a bunch of money to get rid of our debt. For example, that when we decide to get rid of our debt, we will do so by taxing wealthy people who have more than enough money to get rid of our debt, rather than just printing a bunch of money and driving inflation. Um, and so this is a, um, you know, that's the, um, you know, I think that's the reason for the strength of the dollar as a means of, as a way of denominating international exchange. Um, and so that's, so I think you have to separate that from the utility of the dollar itself. Um, there's, there's no question, you, you talked about other countries that don't have KYC providers because it's sort of the wild west for identity fraud. And, you know, I think it was a couple of podcasts back that you had, a, I spent a little while listening to one of the uh, discussions where you talked about uh, your foundation having a huge problem with uh, fake identities, with identity fraud. Okay. And, and you know, that is a reflection of the fact that we do not have a secure 
biometrically verified um, root of root of authentic um, identity uh, in this country and the the free world. I think that the the way to solve that is what they've done on, throughout the EU. They're in the process of making making every citizen of the EU uh, have, if they wish, the ability to prove they are who they say they are online, and then you can use it or not. Okay, so that if someone sends me an email, um, you know, I don't know if how much do you, do you even look at your spam filter contents anymore? You know, I I may be on a high value target. I actually target. do. You actually do. Yeah. Well, I'm a high value target, and so the number of really competent phishing attempts that I see in my spam filter is pretty impressive. You get all these AIs that are busy impersonating all my family members and everything else, um, and and you know the at least the the filter that I use is pretty good at, at classifying them as spam. But, you know, ultimately what's going to happen on that is that if someone sends me an electronic communication and they are unwilling to attach a digital signature from a legally traceable person, they can send me that message. But I will assume that they are AI robot generated trash and put it in my spam filter that, that we're going to have to, you know, for auth for identity generally in this country, we're going to have to start with a, the root of authentic authentication as a a way of proving you are a legally traceable person, and then attach whatever degree of anonymity you want on top of that for the transaction at hand. So that, um, and so that is, I think, you know, and and crypto is one reflection of the wider problem of a of having a secure, trusted digital identity. And and when you, we talk about operating across national boundaries, that requires a tremendous level of trust. Um, you're seeing, for example, if you talk about witness protection programs, okay, you know, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to get a phone call from the French and say, you know, you got an American citizen on vacation in France. As far as we can tell, there's identity theft going on there. It's not really. And you're going to go, Shh, you know, that is a retired Russian spy. Uh, okay. And so there's going to have to be a, and so, you know, um, you know, basically, witness protection programs or retirement programs for spies are basically government-sponsored um, identity fraud, all right, synthetic identity fraud. And we have to leave that hook in existence. Government will need to operate that hook, and that provides a very that demands a very high level of trust between the governments, which will have interoperable identity systems. All right. But let's. Um, I want to make sure to address something here, which is that any system where you have people um, that they have to opt in for some kind of identity, uh, let's call it like digital identity, um, it's going to necessarily leave people out. You know, I, I think there's some stat that I read recently was something like 50% of Americans have never called an Uber, which is shocking to me as someone who, you know, calls Ubers all the time. But the fact is, you know, our, our digital worlds are still not encompassing of the entire citizenry, let alone, you know, countries that are as you said, very left behind because they're the wild, wild west. And where I think access to the dollar is probably you know, most needed uh, because people are victims of um, rampant inflationary economies. And so how do you think about the pros and cons of a more inclusive system where you're going to have more people fall through the cracks versus something where you require digital identity that might instill a lot of safety and security, but where you're going to leave a lot of people out just by nature of the system uh, because we just don't have everyone having uh, we can't give everyone digital IDs unless you're um, instituting a system like India's, which is very comprehensive, but also surveillance driven. Well, I think you know, part of the uh, thing that made that difficult in the recent past is the fact that poor people didn't have cell phones. And interestingly, because of the, the bills we passed recently in the last session of Congress, um, you know, the you have... Um, well, at least if Congress re-ups the funding, which is currently on, on the verge of running out, um, if you're a person without any means, you have the the right to a low-end cell phone contract. I mean, and it is usually the contract rather than the device that's the barrier. And when you go to to um, food pantries in my district, they often have a big stack of of uh, donated cell phones. Uh, where people wanted to upgrade their cell phone and say, oh, I'll give it to the food pantry and to ease my guilt instead of just throwing it in the trash. And um, and so these are, uh, and then, it, so obviously if you go into a location with wireless, you have the ability to use that digital identity. So that the um, the threshold for 
you know, for that is very low in our country. The, those, I think well over 90% of Americans, I think it's over 95% have access to a cell phone, um, you know, either themselves or in their family. And so that barrier has largely been crossed. Those that don't are people that choose not to operate a cell phone or are, you know, mentally not capable of doing it. Um, that it really, that it's essentially a universal thing. And it, and the amount of money that you'd have to provide to make it truly universal. So I think it's not, it's not the poverty, at least in the United States, that prevents it. And even in places like India, you know, where you can buy incredibly cheap cell phones, uh, the most... You know, the huge majority of the population has has access to that. Um, and, and the economic benefits of having a digital identity are large. You know, just in terms of being able to claim government benefits, because if you're poor enough that you can't afford a cell phone, you're eligible for all manner of government assistance. And the problem is that, you know, it's a, a real burden to go and prove that you qualify for every ver version of you know, rental assistance or this or that. Um, if you would simply be able to get out your phone, do your biometric login to your phone, prove you are who you say you are to the government, you could instantly then qualify for, uh, you know, many of the in assistance programs without having to worry about this narrative that, oh, all government payments are fraud written. Um, in fact, that's one of the big advantages in India of the system they've set up where they have been able to have really reduced the amount of fraudulent payments in their government assistance programs because they have a secure digital identity. And, you know, obviously there's no, if you're asking the government to give you money for special circumstances, you don't, shouldn't expect uh, any expectation of privacy on that. It would be nice if the government didn't tell all your friends that you were doing this, uh, but it's not, you shouldn't expect that the government won't keep a record of who's claiming benefits. Um, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. I have one last question, and then we'll we'll wrap up. And it's um, it takes us back to our conversation about um, trust in government. And, and I'll say, you know, you're talking probably to an audience and an industry that has I would, what I would call maybe lower than average trust in government. Um, and so I wanted to give you the chance just to make your pitch. Uh, you know, when you're talking about something like universal KYC for self custodied wallets. Um, how would you convince our audience that they should give government a chance um, to see something like this, um, like similar legislation or, re or regulatory barriers pass that allow for that type of um, uh, tracking? I think the first thing to do is to make uh, make it possible for the government to attach a KYC to a wallet and not necessarily even make it mandatory. Uh, simply saying the, that FinCEN will provide a mechanism where you go hit their API and you can attach a certification to your wallet uh, that this person is legally traceable. He's anonymous, but legally traceable if you can take it to a court system. And then let the market decide. If you want to buy an NFT from, from someone where you can see it's been traded anonymously with unknown amounts of, of, um, of fraudulent wash trades or, or similar having gone on, you can buy that NFT. Or if you prefer to buy an NFT where all the transactions since the time it was originated um, took place between legally traceable wallets, then you, um, then you have a much higher level of certainty that you're not going to be subject to the sort of fraudulent trading, and you're going to have more confidence and be more willing to buy into that sort of asset structure. And so my suggestion is for uh, people in the crypto industry to roll around that possible future and think about the fraction of the use cases of crypto uh, that could be uh, beneficially affected by having the ability to have um, have wallets that are are you know are knowable uh, with the right legal proceedings under a trusted court system and among the free democracies of the world. Congressman Bill Foster, thank you for joining us on Validated. Thank you.